let's let's begin uh, class number four. It's it's great to see you all. Uh, and the idea for this class, let me uh, kind of give you a quick preview of what's about to happen. In many ways, some of what we will learn today is is a continuation of the conversation we had two weeks ago. Uh, we will pick some of the, the phrases that were shared, the quotes that were shared, and then we will continue to move forward and to try to understand the idea of the afterlife in some texts of the Middle Ages, mostly uh, Rambam, Maimonides on one end, a rationalist guy. So it's interesting to see how a rationalist guy deals with the afterlife. Uh, and then we will go back to the idea of the reincarnation that we spoke about uh, two weeks ago. And there was one question that was asked two weeks ago in terms of how does it work uh, and how you know, do we explain which souls get to be new and which souls get to be reused or recycled uh, and coming back, which was part of uh, the questions that two weeks ago some of you had. Uh, and also, my idea for today is to show you how the different aspects of the Jewish afterlife do not work very well with each other all the time. So there are multiple visions and versions of the Jewish afterlife, and they don't necessarily play very well together. But that's not a problem because, you know, in, in the Jewish tradition, you can have multiple avenues and we can uh, choose what speaks and resonates with us uh, the most. Okay, so this is a little bit uh, what we want to do. Janet is saying, please give definition of soul. It is so hard to, uh, to explain what the soul is, but let's say that, you know, the classic definition is that we are a body and a soul and you know life happens when those when those two are together you know functioning together and the afterlife seems to be the stage in which the soul which according to some of our texts is a little bit of a part of god god self goes back to its uh, source goes back to god okay so the soul can be understood according to some of the texts as part of God, God self that, you know, we get to uh, enjoy, uh, you know, during our lifetime. But, but again, it's a word that is tricky to, uh, to define. But, you know, for the, for the time's sake and for, for right now, I guess that this, is, this could be a good approach. So let me share my screen. And let's, are you, do, do you see the presentation, Jewish Afterlife Class 4? Yeah. Very good. So the good thing about having two screens is that I see you in one, and I see the presentation in the other, which makes perfect sense. So first, actually, I want to begin by, again, going back to these two phrases that, that we spoke about last last class, and I think that are very interesting in the way uh, they present a few things. So when the reform movement and the conservative movement and even some parts of the modern orthodox movement in the 19th century had to deal with all these things, you know, we get this idea of the belief in bodily resurrection has no religious foundation. Okay, the, 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 the Central Conference of American Rabbis or at the time, the Conference of American Reform Rabbis was very much against this whole idea of the, the, the bodily resurrection. Uh, and I will explain why, or I will try to explain why. But it's interesting the, the, the way they justify where they are. So has no religious foundation. When I read that phrase for the first time, I said, what does it mean that this particular a belief has no religious foundation. We saw that the Bible speaks a little bit about resurrection, not a lot, but it speaks the book of Daniel. Uh, and then we, we didn't see it, but the Talmud has plenty of stuff related to 
uh, bodily resurrection. And the Amida that we read three times a day, every day of our lives, speaks about bodily resurrection. What does it mean that something has no religious foundation? So it's interesting to see this phrase and the next one that I will show in just a minute as the, the children of their context. So the reform movement and to a certain extent, the conservative movement, they all come with this idea of presenting an enlightened rational version of what Judaism is all about. So when, when we are talking about things that you cannot rationally justify, you just need to move farther and farther away from them. Uh, to me, the interesting part is that there are many other ways to say, I don't resonate so much with the idea of bodily resurrection than to claim that it has no religious foundation. Because actually it has. It may not speak to us, but it has plenty of religious foundation. And not only that, if you read the other text that was also from the last part of the 19th century, we reject as ideas not rooted in Judaism, the belief both in bodily resurrection, in Geena, in Eden, so heaven and hell, or hell and heaven, as a boat for everlasting punishment or reward. And again, as it happened before, like ideas not rooted in Judaism. What the heck is that? You know, today, I guess that most of us in the enlightened uh, progressive uh, camp of Jewish thought would actually acknowledge all the time that our ideas, many of our ideas, were not rooted originally in Judaism. The truth is that we praise ourselves in the idea that Judaism was never a very closed ghetto and we were able to adopt and adapt all sorts of concepts in our exchange and in our meeting and encounter with other cultures all around, okay? Uh, so this idea that we reject because they are not Jewish enough, to me is funny. And again, we can have the conversation regarding how much of all of this has changed from the you know last uh, part of the 19th century to the first part of the 21st century because I think that we look at Judaism from a completely different perspective. I don't know, you know, Rabbi, what, what do you think? But, uh, you know, before we move forward. Yeah, I just, I mean, it's funny that you uh, focused or, you know, zeroed in on that phrase because I had never really thought about it that way is this idea is not rooted in Judaism. And it, for a movement that sort of prides itself on, um, on uh, ever evolving and, and ever um, uh, expansive, uh, that's where the progressive piece comes from, that you're right. I mean, so much of kind of who we are today and the way in which we practice, I mean, what does rooted in Judaism mean? It, it, I, I mean, you could draw a dotted line, you could draw a straight line. Um, so I, I think what, what they likely meant to say was that belief both in bodily resurrection and Gehenna and, and Eden as abodes for everlasting punishment or reward are in complete contradiction with the sort of linear rational enlightenment thought that we hold to be central and really the the, the midpoint for all the spokes that are, you know, come out for Reform Judaism. But they, they didn't say that. It, it was a little bit of a cop out, if you will. Yeah, and, and again, it's like, to me, I'm bringing all of this just as an exercise of how texts are related to their particular contexts. And so for them, it was very important, I would claim, to present the Judaism that was strong enough without the need of all these concepts that they were not so uh, comfortable with. So instead yeah. of saying, it's like, uh, you know, I don't believe in X, Y, or Z, they would say this is not originally Jewish. I think it's like, looks like it's not the best uh, strategy in general, 
but it worked for them at that moment. Rabbi? Yes. Somebody is asking in the chat, Janet's asking if we could just give kind of a working definition, at least how, as you're using the term for soul. Yeah, I, I did it. I did it. Trust okay. me, I did it. Okay. You can check out the video. Sorry. <laughs> but it's okay. Yes, I tried. I, I don't know if I succeeded, but but yes. I, I missed it, so keep going. Yeah. Uh, so this was just an introduction in, again, it's like, it shows us that some concepts may resonate more or less with us, and we deal with them in a variety of, of ways. The truth is that these phrases from the 19th century are a great segue to see how a medieval rabbi, Maimonides, who was not fond of bodily resurrection either, how he dealt in the uh, 12th century. So it's you know, 800 years ago, how he dealt with his not, not finding himself so comfortable with this idea of the bodily resurrection, okay? But for that, I need to take a slight detour into this text from the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the first text of what is known about the, you know, from the oral Torah. Uh, so it was put together, edited around the year 220, of our common era, so 1800 years ago. And in, in the Mishnah, in the tractate of Sanhedrin, the 10th chapter of that tractate begins with a very interesting phrase, Kol Israel yesh la'em chelek la'olam abba, which is Hebrew for all the Jewish people have a share in the world to come, which is nice. So it's like, be happy. You all have a fair share in the world to come, no matter what. But the problem is that it doesn't take so you know, longer than quoting a verse that they begin here uh, to say, and these are the ones who have no share in the world to come. So it's like the, the, rabbis, are in, oh, oh, the rabbis are engaging in something that is kind of cruel because they begin, oh, come on, give me one second. They begin with this beautiful phrase. So we all say, yes, we have a share. And then right away, these are the those who have no share in the world to come. So one who says, who, who doesn't have a share in the world to come? One who says there is no resurrection of the dead derived from the Torah. So if you say that you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, of the dead, according to the Mishnah, according to this text, you don't get a spot in the next stage, okay? It's not only that, one who says the Torah did not originate from heaven, so if you don't believe in the uh, heavily origins of the Torah, you are out. And also an apikoides, Apikoides is a Hebrew for an heretic, but it's coming from the Greek, from the Epicurean, uh, you know, originally from the Epicurean uh, school of thought in, in, in Greek, uh, in Greece, that was this idea that, you know, you should enjoy bodily pleasures and whatever. And uh, so that word became synonym in the Jewish tradition for an heretic. Not only if you are a an Epicurean, but if you do all sorts of things, okay? Rabbi Akiba also says, also including the exception are those, one who reads external literature. So if you are into Greek philosophy, you're out. Uh, one who whispers invocations over a wound and says as an invocation for healing, whatever, this verse from Exodus, okay? By doing so, he shows contempt for the sanctity of the name of God and therefore has no share in the world to come. Abba Shaul says, which is another rabbi, also including the exception is one who pronounces the ineffable, ineffable name of God as it is written with its letters. So if you say God's name out loud, or if you play with God's name for healing purposes, you are out as well. So what do we learn from this text in the Mishnah? Any takes? You know, th this text I will say will present something of a seed of a revolution 
and I will try to explain it, but any comments on this text, any reactions to this text? I have a reaction and a comment, Rabbi, but I'm going to wait for somebody else. Yeah. So it sort yeah. of reminds me of the second paragraph of the Shema, where it says, um, you know, you're going to be blessed, and you know, but if you do all these bad things, forget it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. I, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting link. So the second part of the Shema says, if you do what you need to do, it will be awesome, and you will get all the rewards. If you don't, you you don't get dessert before going to bed. Okay, it's like it's the the basic yeah. rewards and punishments that uh, that we see all through the Bible, all, all through the Torah. Yeah. Yes, Rabbi. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, this about the fourth or fifth line. He talks that there is no resurrection of the dead derived from the Torah, but he doesn't say bodily re resurrection of the dead. Yeah, but 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 here it's okay, very clear that it's bodily resurrection. Omer ain't chiata meitim in a Torah. Okay. It's like, now, we can make the point that if they are going this this deep with such a very harsh phrase, is because probably at the time there were plenty of folks that would say there is no bodily resurrection from the Torah, which, by the way, it's what we saw it two classes ago, like a month ago. I try to show you that there is no resurrection so much in the Bible. Hebrew Bible doesn't speak about resurrection so much. So the rabbis are trying to curb the, the way or shape the, the way Jews must think by going all the way. So you want the share in the world to come? Well, this is the type of things that you need to believe. Okay? But, but probably that happens because there's not a whole lot of reasons to believe. Elaine. Yes, I have a question. Yes. How would we know if there was not a word of mouth concept of the resurrection or life after death that they felt was never necessary to get into the Torah? How do we know back with Moses and all that? This was an assumed thing that everyone knew throughout the ages and they felt it wasn't necessary to write about. Well, it's it's a good question. So it might be that they believed or they they thought about the the afterlife, but they, they, they didn't they didn't feel the need to include any of that in the text. Could be, could be. the 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 challenge there is that we can go and and do all sorts of assumptions. We can make all sorts of assumptions, but it's like a zero sum game because you can go either way with mm -hmm. what is not written. But, but certainly it could be that some folks believed in the afterlife, on the, the resurrection, and they just didn't get it into the book, 100%. John, you are muted. Is the implication of the statement then that uh, Akiva is saying there is uh, re uh, resurrection of the dead in the Torah? Because it's saying if you if you say there isn't, you're not going to share in the world to come. To me, that implies the general belief is that there is that statement in the Torah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva represents the voice of, of those who say, yes, there is resurrection of the dead in Judaism. And not only that, you can find the seeds of that belief in the Torah. Is that right or not? Well, it's a matter of interpretation, which is very Jewish, by the way. Uh, now, we can read this story or this line from Rabbi Akiva saying that even if you believe that there is triata meitim, so even if you believe that there is resurrection from the, you know, for the dead, that is not enough unless you believe that this is coming from the Torah. Okay? So even if you believe that there is resurrection, but you don't tie that resurrection to some text in the Torah, you are out. That may be one reading. Uh, I know that Rabbi has something to say, but anyone else? Julie? Um, in some sense, it seems to me to be in some way defining who is a Jew because of the restrictions. If you don't believe this, if you don't believe that or whatever, you're out. Correct. And, and you know, if you are having some noise or issues with that you are in the right place 
that, that's what I'm gonna uh, push in just a moment. But yes, Judy, you are right. This text, which is a minority, it's like we don't have too many of these texts all through the Mishnah or all through the Talmud. But in this particular text, it seems that you get a reward not for what you do, but for what you believe or you don't believe, which is, I would say, a revolution in Judaism that will come to full, uh, you know, it will come to full, uh, you know, uh, how say, it's like to full force in the Middle Ages, which is where we are going. We are headed to, towards the Middle Ages, but, but up until this moment, and going back to what Lorna was saying before, most of the time, the, 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 the equation, the equation with punishments and rewards happen in the Bible regu regarding what you do or you don't do. It's never what you believe. It's, you know, go and look for something that says that if you don't believe in X, Y, or Z, you're out, or you're gonna be punished. Mm -hmm. Usually it doesn't happen. Judaism is focused on what we do, not so much about what we believe, but that will change at least for some folks uh, in the Middle Ages, but the seeds of that I want to show, you know, are, are rooted in some texts from the times of the Talmud. Rabbi. You covered it. I do not need to add anything. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Rabbi, can, can I ask a question? It's, yes, uh, you can. It's Paul, Paul Zanuck, yeah. Um, just explain to me, please, um, the, the phrase, one who whispers invocations over a wound and says as an invocation for healing, every illness that I placed upon Egypt, I'm not placed upon you for I'm the Lord your healer. What does it actually mean? So it's a good question. It's like, it has to be, a, you know, the text is, is a contradiction in and of itself because, you know, the text in Exodus 15, which happens right after we cross the Red Sea, shows up by presenting God saying, that the illness that I placed upon Egypt, I will not place upon you, yep. because I'm your God. Now, if you are whispering that verse, you know, as an invocation for healing, that is actually a slap in the face because supposedly God said that we won't have to suffer this type of illness. Do you see what's going on? It's yes, like, so, so it's redundant. It's, uh, so it's, it's because it's, it's, not, redundant. it's not only it's not redundant, but it's contradictory. Because the verse says that we won't suffer from illness. Uh -huh. And if you are using that verse to cure an illness, it's kind of rubbing it off like God. It's like you told us that, you know, we won't suffer from this. And so all of these incantations are against. And, you know, it's not a matter of magic tricks either, which is also why the, 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 the Mishnah ends with Abba Shaul saying that you cannot use God's name uh, for, for all sorts of things. By the way, two weeks ago, we also spoke about the Baal Shem Tov in the connection with, with the with the D-book. Remember, we closed speaking of the D-book uh, and, and the Baal Shem Tov or the Baalei Shem Tov, th those were a group of folks in, in Central Europe in the, in the 17th and 18th centuries will go and will use the good name of God to exorcise folks, to take the extra soul or debug or you know demon or whatever it was that got stuck into them okay so uh, but but in the mishnah that is not something that you should be doing now let me continue and moving forward because again my claim for today is that this revolution that begins in this text and others in the mishnah but the, the mishnah but not too many texts will come to full force during the middle ages so for those of you who read some Hebrew, what is this? What do you see in the screen? Can you tell me? Igdal. The Igdal. So I don't know if uh, you know we sing it at Shul, but at Micah, do you sing the Igdal at Micah? No, we're, we're, we really prefer 14 principles over 14? 13. Really? <laughs> no, no, we don't. But, but again, so let me tell you a little bit about the story of this 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 uh, po poem that that became kind of one of the ways that traditional services come to an ending uh, in in traditional synagogues. 
The Igdal has 13 lines and actually is the condensation of 13 principles of faith that Maimonides brings together in his commentary to the Mishnah. So Maimonides, this guy that probably you've heard of, Rambam, grew up in Spain, had to leave, went to uh, Morocco, had to leave, went to Egypt, then to Israel briefly, came back to Egypt. Probably one of the, if not the most, the, the brightest Jew ever. In, you know, it's a physician, philosopher, Allah, Allah, Allah guy. It's impressive. When he was in his 20s, he writes a commentary on the Mishnah. And uh, in, in that text, he will come up to condense Judaism in 13 principles of faith. So you need to believe in 13 things if you want to be in. The conversation in the Middle Ages is that uh, in order to do the right thing, you need to believe in the right thing. Okay, we may have disagreements on, on that, but you know, something that is a novelty in the Middle Ages, some Jews come with these lists of what would be called dogmas, okay, principles of faith. Um, okay, those are the 13. If you go in a Siddur and you read the translation, you can see what the 13 principles are. This is not the text that Maimonides wrote. This was written based on what Maimonides said. To me, for our purposes, I want to focus on this last line of the Igdal on the 13th principle of faith. Actually, that's it. Baruch Adeyad Shem Teilato is the closing. But this is Hebrew for God with great mercy will give life to the dead. May God's name be praised forever. So the last line of the Igdal speaks about the bodily resurrection, which is interesting because it shows that Maimonides at least pushes for this as a principle of faith, among other things, because he got it from the Mishnah, so he cannot get away. Okay, so he has to take it because that is what he learned from Rabbi Akiva in terms of the Mishnah but it's still an interesting journey. So come with me on this interesting journey. So that's Maimonides. Actually, we don't know if that is how he looked like because there were no pictures or selfies, but the truth is that this is Maimonides' signature. I held Maimonides' signature in my hands. There are uh, letters that he wrote and signed that made, you know, they survived and they are part, you know, in in many places, but the JTS has a couple of those in New York. So I was able to hold one in my hands. It's pretty like, you know, it's like for kids having like the LeBron James autograph. Well, for a rabbi was to hold the, you know, my money, this autograph. And, you know, LeBron James is still alive. This guy passed away 800 years ago. So it does, you know, it was kind of a cool thing. The story of how this survived is connected to the Cairo Gniza. I don't know if you ever heard the story. It's a, it's a remarkable, sweet, beautiful story. Uh, and in a, in a synagogue outside of Cairo, as you may know, we don't throw away religious texts that are no longer usable. Okay, We put them in a place in the attic at the synagogue and at, at, you know, every now and then we go and we bury those texts in the cemetery. All Sidurim, Torahs, all sorts of things. Uh, well, it looks like in Cairo, they kept bringing documents into the attic of the synagogue and they never took them to the cemetery. So uh, 100 years ago, Solomon Schechter, also known for putting the names in many schools in the United States, but that is in order to honor him, not because he had, you know, whatever, but he found, he was called to, to go to Egypt because they found this bunch of old documents among the documents that were there, letters from this guy. It's like mind blowing. So this is a different way of an afterlife. Okay, if your signature survives 800 years and there is a rabbi speaking like, you know, so excited about that, that is an interesting afterlife, I would say. Anyway, my money this, in his introduction to this chapter on the Mishnah that I, I just read for you, speaks about 
all these concepts, what is the world to come, what is the genom, so hell, what is heaven, what is the Messiah, all sorts of things. But then he speaks about the revival of the dead, Chiyadameitim. So he says, the revival of the dead, not the dead, uh, give me one second, now I see some of the chat, sorry. Typical Judaism to a more sides of every issue. Yes, that is correct. Steve, you are completely right. And thank God for that. Uh, Marsha says, this sounds so harsh as there are so many different levels of belief in Judaism and how we interpret all the rules from keeping kosher and kashrut. Again, keeping kosher and kashrut are things that you do. Here we are talking about things that you must or should believe. It shows only in this Mishnah, it becomes a big issue in the Middle Ages, but that doesn't mean that we have to do all of these. And actually I'm bringing this because my claim, I'm not the first in claiming this, but my claim is that Maimonides didn't believe in bodily resurrection and still had to put it because it was part of the Jewish uh, corpus of ideas. But it doesn't make any sense. And I will try to explain to you why if you are a Maimonidean Jew, the revival of the dead, the dead is something that you are actually not looking forward to get. Okay, that would be my point. And Rabbi, I would also just suggest that knowing that the, the typical default for Judaism is to legislate our actions rather than our beliefs, when we do see something that, for example, the mission that Rabbi brought to us that does legislate or speak to how it is we're supposed to think about a particular issue or believe about a particular, what we're supposed to believe, to me, it says, if I'm thinking about the social historical reality of the day, that there was some sort of threat to or, or strong influence around resurrection or, or some other sort of pagan way of understanding what happens to us after we die, that the Jewish community or the sages at the time felt like it was imperative for the protection and cohesion and, pers and perseverance of the community to, to move into the realm of thought and belief. Um, that's what it says to me, like th that's a red flag of there was something going on that was so very threatening that it required that kind of action. Yeah, and it's completely possible that that was the case. And I, you know, the longer I study all of these things and I will try to show you with, with the last text from the mystical side, I think that when the rabbis are speaking about these things happening in the afterlife, they are all actually using some of these ideas to reflect back on what is happening in this life. So it's like we, we use the afterlife as a jumping board to actually come back and, and try to get some insights regarding how we need to live our lives here and now. Do you see? It's like, I, I think that it, they, they go there in order to reflect back on how should we live today, okay? So, Maimonides writes, the revival of the dead is from the, ma is from the main fundamental principles of, the, of Moshe, our teacher, peace be upon him, and there is no religion and no attachment to the Jewish religion for the one who does not believe in this, but it is only for the righteous. Oh, but by the way, it's like Maimonides is already saying that only the righteous folks are the ones who get to be uh, revived, okay? It's only for the righteous. And so too is this found in the language of Bereshit Rabbah, which is a Midrash. The power of rain is for the righteous and, and for the evildoers, but the revival of the dead is only for the righteous. And how should the evildoers be revived as they are dead even in their lifetime? So for, for someone who is a rational Jew who has been learned and knows the, the texts, he knows that you know someone who is alive and is a meaningful force in nature after their, their death, they are still alive. And people who are dead, you know, people who are evil, are dead even in this uh, level of existence. So, and so too did they say in the Talmud, evildoers are called dead even in their lives. Righteous people are called living even in their death. And you should know that man perforce must die and decompose and return to what he is composed of. So see what he's doing. He begins by saying that this is a fundamental principle in, in the Torah. He says that it's only for the righteous folks. But then 
when when he comes here he transforms this idea of life and death more of a metaphor of your life if you're a righteous person you are alive it doesn't matter whether you breathe or not and if you're a, an evil guy you are dead in, in in a certain specific way you are completely dead you are you are rotten to your core and then see how he closes you should know that man perforce must die and decompose and return to what he is composed of so he's saying make peace with the idea of we die which is interesting because he began speaking about the revival of the dead which is on the miraculous end of the spectrum and he ends with something that is very rational and cold if you want reminding everyone that revival or not revival resurrection or not, no resurrection we must die okay which again to me is an interesting insight now i am telling you all of this because in 1191 so maimonides was born in 1135 or 1140 actually no nobody knows exactly when people are born in you know in the old days because who knew if those people would be relevant later on so nobody knows but they speak about 1135 or 40 and he died in 1204 okay he wrote this text in his 20s now in the year 1191 so closer to you know 15 years before he died 13 years before he died he was accused in life of not believing in resurrection see how it goes this is the only time he speaks about resurrection in his work mishne torah shows up only briefly in the context of chuba there is no mention whatsoever of resurrection in his work, Morene uh, Buhim, uh, the guide for the perplexed, doesn't speak. By the way, he doesn't mention at all the idea of the transmigration of the soul. So the reincarnation that we spoke at length last time around, Maimonides doesn't even speak about it. He doesn't know about the concept. Doesn't mean that he doesn't believe. We don't know because it's not that he says this thing doesn't exist. He just don't mention anything. But resurrection, briefly mentioned here, briefly mentioned in his work of uh, Allah, not mentioned at all in uh, his philosophical work. So by 19, by 1191, he has to go out and write a whole treaty on resurrection, which is an apologetic text saying, no, 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 I believe, and you don't understand me. So he had to go full-fledged to try to explain himself. Now, let me try to walk you briefly why I believe, and people in his own <laughs> lifetime believed as well, that he didn't believe so much in bodily resurrection. For Maimonides, a rational, rationalist guy, he thinks that we are born, we live, we die. Now, if we were good people, when we die, heaven or the world to come is translated in Maimonides, someone who loved to think quite a bit, as the moment in which you are connected all the time, 24-7, with the big brain that God is. So for someone who likes to think, what's the idea of heaven? You are connected to your source 24-7, all day long. Okay? So here in this, so that is if you were good. If you were bad, there is no more connection. Okay? You're out. So the, the heaviest of all punishments, you are no longer connected with that source of knowledge that God is. So let's let's try to imagine this using modern metaphors. The world to come is 5G. 24-7, 5G. Hell is no connection whatsoever. Your cellular phone was taken out. It's like the nightmare of any teenager and a couple of adults. This world, 
our connection to God is like the type of connection that we used to have when there were like telephone modems. Do you remember the, the modem that we used to use back in the day when the internet was over the phone with the ugly noise and very slow? So if you follow me along, in this bodily existence, we connect to God in a very limited way. We have moments. We have moments in which like the Internet Explorer of 1992 shows us the picture that we wanted to see. We had to wait for like three months, but we saw it. We got a glimpse. It was awesome. Then we die. And we have like connection all, all day long. Why on earth are we willing to go and be back in our bodies at the end of the road? It's like once you are with the 5G, who on earth is willing to go back to the telephone modem? I'll go ahead and give up my cell phone. I'm going there. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. But you see what I'm saying? So Maimonides, who claims that you will get the best possible connection to God once you are dead, why on earth would he be willing to go back to life? It doesn't make any sense. So be good. When the time comes, you transition to the next stage and enjoy the upgrade. Don't go back to the, you know, whatever. And so it's very clear when you read Maimonides in general that that's where he stands. So if you understand his concepts of heaven and hell, Triata Meitim, the bodily resurrection, doesn't give him much. Reincarnation probably wouldn't give him much either, because again, any coming back to this earthly experience takes away the, the, the connection and gives you back the old connection, which for him was something that he didn't want. Okay? Any comments to this? Because I will leave my monides and move to the mystical teachings of Judaism for the last 15 minutes. Can I just ask a, a very simple question, Rabbi? Yeah. That is, what is the definition actually of revival of the dead? I mean, what is it? Is it a mental state? Is it a physical state? Is it, what do they mean by that? It is a physical state. So for, for the classic- Is the reincarnation? Is this the reincarnation of a physical soul? Ah, physical soul? so the resurrection is the physical coming back of the body with the soul. Now, the reincarnation or the transmigration of the souls which goes back to my point of you cannot have them both because or, or you could, but you have to create a very, very complex structure. If the resurrection means that at the end of the days when the Messiah comes, our bodies are fully like refleshed and resold for the purpose of living another life and then we die again. If your soul is jumping from body to body, at the end of the days, in which body your soul is going to come? In the last one? What about the, the previous iterations of whoever you were? OK, do you see? Yeah. I'm just trying to show the inconsistencies of all of those ha happening together. The solution is that it doesn't have to be all of them or nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, it's like, but, but all of them together, you just need to create like, you know, if resurrection and reincarnation, both of them happen, you have only one of the bodies with one of the souls. So many bodies are out. Or you have many bodies with the same soul, which is also weird. But, you know, again, may happen. Yeah. Um, okay. I so so do, this is Susan. Does, so does Maimonides believe that there is something after death? Mm hmm he yes. believes. So his belief is a continuation that is manifested in the connection that we have with the source of everything, which is God, which in his particular way of understanding life, that is like being connected to the source of everything, but mostly regarding this, the, the, the source of all knowledge. So that is what you do. It's like you contemplate the the Shina, the divine presence and the light and the wisdom and whatever, and that's that's bliss. 
places being all the time uh, facing the divine with no separations, with no lag in communication, with no uh, slow internet, uh, whatever. That, that's Maimonides. It's only one. Again, it's like for me, it's showing you uh, what he thought and also the, the reform rabbis or the conservative rabbis of the 19th century were not the first to feel at odds with the resurrection. But Maimonides is playing under a different set of rules. So since the Mishnah is saying that those who don't believe out loud uh, and vocally that you know in, in the resurrection of the dead are out, he just have to play the game. If you try to understand his philosophy, I think that deep, 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 deep inside, he wouldn't put a whole lot of money on that. Not because he didn't believe that that was possible. That's a different conversation. It's more on the side that he probably didn't want to come back under those circumstances or terms. Yeah, That's right, correct. Right. So, so Miri is quoting uh, Anisham Allah. Uh, and, and yes, it's like all of this uh, is coming from God, but, but this idea that will come once and again, that, that the soul is Helek Eloa Mimal, as the, the first Lubavitcher rabbi, Rebbe, Rabbi Shnir Zalman of Liadi, writes in the Tanya. Yes. Any other I, comment? I, I wonder how the Rambam's uh, profession as a physician played into a lot of his interpretations. I, I think that a whole lot. You, you are right. You are on point. My Maimonides was a physician. So I don't think that this, it's, this is not by chance. Okay, You should know that per force, we die. It's, it's the word of a physician. It's someone who knows how the body works. Uh, and, and I think that that is certainly, you know, his rationalistic mind and, and his work as a physician are permeating the way he sees the world, 100%. Okay? okay. Now, it's like, I will take the fruit of your labor from the slichot uh, uh, phrase that Miri was quoting in order to move quickly into the uh, the Sefer Abair, the Jewish proto Kabbalah, and uh, you know a few words on the, the reincarnation conversation. So what is that? That's the Etz Chaim, right? It's the Etz Chaim, the Tree of Life, is such an important metaphor in Jewish texts that uh, you know you actually see it all through our texts, and we see it uh, in all different contexts. And it's interesting to see that according to the Sefer Abair, which is a, it's a proto-Kabbalistic work, Middle Ages, the book that was the most important Kabbalistic book before the existence of the Zohar, the Sefer Abair will actually think that what, what you see is what happens in heaven. So how souls are born? That is like the question that I have for you connected to the reincarnation. So it's like, again, the tree is actually hooked or, you know, whatever, how do you say, planted up in heaven. So it, that is how you see it now upside down. Okay. See what the Sefer Abair has to say. What is the tree that you mentioned? He said it represents the powers of the blessed Holy One, one above the other. It's the tree of the Sefirot, for those of you who know uh, some Kabbalah. Just like a tree brings forth fruit through water, so the Blessed Holy One increases the power of the tree through water. So again, this is, this is like the powers of the Holy One. How is the tree nurtured? The tree, like any, you know, those of you who do some gardening, it's like, no, it's like, the water is important for the tree to grow healthy. What is the water of the Blessed Holy One? Asks the book. It is wisdom. It is the source of the righteous. So the source of the righteous are in this water. They come, okay? They nurture the tree. And from here, you know, souls are the fruits of the tree. 
Okay, that's kind. Do you follow what's the what's the imagery? They fly from the fountain to the great pipe, ascend and attach themselves to the tree. Okay, through what do they fly? Through Israel, and this is the important part. When they are good and righteous, the divine presence dwells among them. Their deeds then rest in the bosom of the blessed Holy One, and He makes them fruitful and multiplies them. So. What is nurturing the water that makes the tree, that makes the soul? How we behave in this world. So, the, you know, how new souls are born? New souls are born, according to this text, every time we are good gardeners. Meaning, when we become the Maim Chaim, the, the living waters feeding the tree, we get new souls. When we don't do our job, then the situation is slightly different. So see what happens in this other text. When Israel is good, then this is the place from which I will bring you seed. A new seed will be granted to you. But when Israel is wicked, then I will bring seed that has already been in the world. It is thus written, a generation goes and a generation comes, teaching us that it has already come. That is the text that we discussed two weeks ago. So to the question that was asked in, you know, last class, from you know, where do we get the new souls of the old souls, the Sefer Abair comes and tells us that it's up to us. And this is where I see how there is this using of the afterlife to reflect on what we do in our life. The last text I have, and then we open it for any commentaries. Why is there a righteous person who has good and another righteous person who has evil? You know, the question that, that is always at the core of the, uh, how do you say, Theodicia or something like that. It's like the divine justice and retribution. Why good folks suffer? This is because the second righteous person was wicked previously and is now being punished. Is one then punished for his childhood deeds? Did not Rabbi Shimon say that in the tribunal on high, no punishment is meted out until one is 20 years or older? He said, I'm not speaking of this present lifetime. I'm speaking about what he has already been previously. Why good folks in this life may suffer? Because of the wrongdoings of previous generations, of previous souls or previous iterations of his own soul. So how the Sefer Abair understands this, when we do our fair share, we nurture God, and God in return brings to the world new souls. When we don't do our fair share, the tree has to be nurtured by old used water, which gets old used souls. And so the reflection on reincarnation doesn't only serves to justify why good guys will suffer, but also allows to push for this wonderful idea, probably one of the most important ideas that I see in the mystical texts of Judaism, that our actions have a consequence not only in this world, but also in the upper realms. It's like it will come to our days with books like Abraham Joshua Heschel's God in Search of Man, this idea that God needs us for the system to work, which to me is a profoundly empowering image that reminds us of how what we do may have repercussions, not only here, but also in the realm of the divine, which again, I don't know about you, but it speaks to me as a very powerful uh, idea, okay? Right. Yes. I, first of all, thank you so much for bringing this text because it's so powerful and you're right. The idea that that um, that the what happens in the divine realm is reliant on, on us, the accountability then for us um, is magnified and it makes me think again, which a, a text we looked at a couple weeks ago of Elu Devarim She'en Lehem Shior, Right, the idea that there are things that we do in this world and we feel the immediate benefit of them, but the principle of doing that 
goes far beyond what we experience in this world. Perhaps in this case, it was um, of Sefer Havahir into the divine realm, but it can be for generations to come. That ripple effect, which is what we often refer to it as, um, is, is indeed powerful and, and real according to our tradition. Yep. Now, uh, Alicia just uh, asked if God need us, needs us or wants us. And I would say that these texts, because the, the question is, it depends on who you ask, very Jewish answer. But the truth is that in these texts, it's very clear that God needs us. It's not only a matter of God wants us to be partners. In, in many texts in the mystical branch of Judaism, we are here to complete God and to make a positive impact in God's creation. And this is not just an idea that we see in, in mystical sources of Judaism, but remember, it's like the Talmud has one line, has many lines, but one line in the Talmud says that our prayers, when we pray every day, there is an angel that takes those letters of our prayers and creates a crown that then the angel flies and puts on top of God's head. I always, I, I, I have always find that metaphor inspiring because it reminds us that if we don't do it, then God might be a king without a crown and without a kingdom because it is us who complete God, but why, what, what we do. And so the Talmud is very aware of, of the fact that our actions matter and, and change. You know, they can change the reality. And it is only by investing in those type of uh, actions that, that we crown God as king, queen, whatever. It's like there is no neutral way of uh, speaking. Uh, well, but, Rabbi, yes. If we were to take the exact um, image that you're offering, and for anybody who thinks of the divine, perhaps not in... Um, person or anthropomorphic, personalized or anthropomorphic terms, the way I understand it, which is very similar to you, Rabbi, but the idea that, that our, our goal um, as, as, a, as a universe, as, as creation, is to achieve an ultimate state of holiness, and that that, that can't happen without our participation. So if we go back to that Lurianic idea of God contract, God is everything and in every place, but in order to create us, there was this seemed soon, this contraction of God and to make space for us. But in the, in that contraction, there was damage done. There's imperfection. And now our presence requires that we step up and help to repair that and, and bring that holiness that, that wholeness back and, and we have a very important role in doing that so so divinity god um, can't be that holiness that um kedusha cannot exist without our participation just another way to think of it yeah 100 i i think that it's uh, and, and and again uh, it, it's on the it's on the need okay we are needed and i think that 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 idea is profoundly powerful because it reminds us that you know many times we don't feel it many times we are disempowered or disengaged or whatever and you know the the jewish tradition in some of its texts comes and says you are needed so you make a difference and and i think that that can be for what happens in the afterlife and certainly for what happens here and now uh, and and again to me personally those are the, the messages that I find inspiring when we are delving into what's gonna happen next. I may not know, but as, as I try to figure out that part, if, if in that journey along what's happening next, I come back with this idea that uh, I am needed for the system to work properly, uh, for, for the tree to flourish and to bear fruits, okay. It's a, uh, you know, we, we may take a while until we figure out what's on the other side. But in the meantime, we have plenty of homework to do in, in this side of the, of the conversation. 
So that's it. Any any final comments, questions, concerns? Anything you want to add? 